Well, good morning and welcome to our latest webinar for the year as we kick off our planner session series looking at the topic of how to reach and to plan in regional Australia. It's great to have you with us wherever you happen to be joining us around Australia. Thank you for taking the time to, to tune in this morning. If I haven't had the chance to meet you before, my name is Gus McHoward uh, and my job this morning is to get out of the way as quickly as possible. I'm going to hand you over to Derek Hanna who is the Director of Training at Geneva Push and he's going to let you know about our panellists this morning which are Bruce Bennett uh, from Orange Evangelical Church as well as Ross Pethybridge from Dalby Presbyterian Church. Before I do that, there's just a couple of housekeeping matters to let you know about. So the first thing to let you know about is that this morning's webinar is interactive as well. So we've got live, free and interactive. We want you to be able to get the most out of this morning. And so use that panel on the right hand side to be able to ask your questions to our panelists. You can send them those through on that toolbar and they'll get delivered through to Derek for him to be able to ask the panelists the questions as they come through. The second thing is just to let you know about our sponsors, EA Insurance. We're really thankful for their partnership with us for these planter session webinars. Uh, if you haven't sorted out your insurance needs for your church, make sure you do chat to EA Insurance. You can jump on their website after the webinar has finished. Well, that's it for me. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Derek now. He's going to introduce you further to Ross and to Bruce and to let you know a little bit more about the structure of what we've got sorted for this morning's webinar. We hope that you enjoy and I'll be in touch just as we finish. Cheers. We want to see churches planted throughout Australia, in the city uh, and in the country. We want to see churches strengthened in the city and the country. And so this morning our hope is to uh, explore with Bruce and Ross, the guys who are doing work in the, uh, the country in rural areas, uh, discover the roadblocks that they've faced, how to reach people in those areas, uh, the uniqueness and the distinctives of actually being able to do that and how to navigate through that. Uh, we'll have a time uh, after we introduce them, hear a few of their thoughts as well, where you can answer, ask questions, as Gus said, so you can throw them uh, on the right-hand side of your screen. I'll keep prompting you to do that. We've got a few questions we sent in beforehand, but as we can see, uh, Ross and Bruce have appeared on screen. Great to have you. Morning, gentlemen. Uh, good day. Morning. morning. All right, it's good. Thanks for uh, giving up time this morning to uh, talk to us. Do you, when you hear me say uh, that 90% of people live in, in uh, urban areas in Australia, how does, it, does that feel like, do you feel like Dolby and Orange are class, classified as rural areas or, uh, or do you feel like they're uh, moving into the urban with the population they are? Uh, Orange is um, a big regional centre and uh, because we've got big health, a bit of government, um, we've got a lot of professionals. So there's, there's a, I've always thought of Orange as the, uh, the sort of the most urban uh, sort of place west of the Blue Mountains um, mm. and uh, so yeah so we're not quite as uh, hick and backwards as you might think um, <laughs> yeah there's plenty of tight jeans and latte being you know around here uh, but we do, how, do how have many a, people there? about 40,000 yeah mm. yeah okay. yeah um, but we do have a, a lot of people from a rural country background uh, Orange is a place where people from smaller country towns tend to be moving for work and for retirement. Yeah, so it's a good mix, good mix. Mm, nice. And Ross, what's, uh, what's uh, Dolby like? Yeah, so Dolby's a town of 12,000 uh, with, a, with a kind of wider population around the outskirts of it as well. Uh, I, I see it as a, a smaller regional centre. Uh, I don't see it as a, um, being in a backward town at all or anything like that. Uh, uh, I think there's lots of infrastructure here and um, yeah, lots of people around. So um, one of the great benefits, though, is you get to know that community that you are around. Yep. Yeah, Ross, you've been in Dolby for 17 years, is that right? Yeah, this is my 17th year. Yeah, okay. Uh, Can you talk a little bit about just the distinctives of Dolby? What, what have you, uh, in that time you've been, which is a significant time, 17 years, what have you, you learnt or seen the kind of characteristics or distinctives of Dolby? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, of course it's a farming community, uh, but that, that's a given. Um, but, you know, a little while back, uh, about seven or eight years ago, I sat down and I thought, actually, what are the distinctives of Dolby? What, what, um, what is our culture here? Uh, and so I started to think about that and I thought, one, it is a, it's a monoculture. Um, so, you know, when I head to, you know, the city in Sydney and I just see multiculturalism there, I don't really see that in Dolby. Um, you know, we have mainly kind of white Anglo-Saxons here 
uh, there's a splattering of kind of Filipinos and South Africans and so forth. But uh, generally speaking, in our churches, there it, it's just one monoculture. Um, it, there's a love for family here. Um, so often in country areas, you get big families and lots of family connections. Uh, family's king, I reckon, here in the country scene. Uh, I think you know one of the other kind of distinctives. I think it's a very practical town um, rather than a the you know so. Uh, so not people aren't kind of many people aren't educated, uh, you know, through universities, uh, but they're educated through the school of kind of hard knocks, mm. and uh, and so you need to be quite practical, I think, in your application, in your preaching, and so forth. Um, of course, it, it, there's a love of vocation uh, in in Dolby here. People don't come to Dolby because it's a beautiful place to live. They come because uh, they want to work. Um, and Is it a beautiful place life. to live, though? Uh, it's not beautiful in in terms of the looks of the place. Um, <laughs> this is being recorded, Ross. I should say yeah. it's been recorded. Uh, but the people are fantastic. I love the people here. <laughs> it's the most friendliest place I've lived, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm. So so with that kind of connection with families, like people are well connected with each other. So there's lots of extended families uh, living in the area. You know, don't say anything bad about someone because uh, someone else will know them. Um, so you just need to be kind of careful and just realise the kind of connections that people have with each other. Uh, and, and at some level it is insulated. Um, so, you know, we live three hours out of Brisbane. Uh, we don't really care about what's going on down in Brisbane. We kind of see ourselves as the centre of the universe, that kind of thing. Um, politically conservative town. Um, uh, so, yeah, they're, they're the kind of distinctives of the place that I live in here. Hmm. Bruce, does any of that uh, ring true for you in Orange, or Orange has got its own character? Yeah, I'd say a lot of what Ross said applies here. Um, even though we're 40,000 people and, and uh, they like to call Orange a city, really we're a big country town. But I think our location, see we're only three hours out of um, Sydney, um, and so I don't think we're as uh, isolated um, in terms of how we think about ourselves. Um, we, we've actually picked up, there's a bit of a, a tree change move. People are selling a home in Sydney, maybe taking a bit of a demotion in work, but moving to Orange, they can own their house. Um, you're, never, you're never more than five minutes from anywhere in Orange and just, just have a quieter lifestyle. But I'd say family is king. Uh, we've probably got a slightly greater mix of other cultures, people from other countries, but I'd say it'd be very similar to Dolby. Um, we're pretty much white Anglo-Saxon. Um, yeah, got a got a reasonable sized Aboriginal community here. Um, I'm not sure what percentage that would be of Orange, but they're seen and known, and yeah, part of the community. Um, mm. I think I'd I'd add. I think generally traditional Christianity is um, less. Uh, it's, it's kind of lost its day-to-day, -day, week by week relevance to people. Um, mm. Not many people we talk to identify strongly with a denomination. Um, they, they might say, oh, "I'm, I'm a Christian," or "I'm not." But yeah, which which actually I think makes people open mm. and freer to talk about stuff uh, about Christian things. Yeah. Do you, someone's just uh, thrown out the idea of the tyranny of distance being um, a phrase that might accurately describe how regional Australia um, feels. Do you, do you feel like people view the distance you are from the capitals as a, as a, a boon or a hindrance? Oh, definitely. Uh, so, you know, one of the issues for me all the time is helping people, you know, move to country areas. Uh, so for me, it, it is, it's nothing for me to drive to Brisbane and back in one day. Um, but, you know, on the other, if you're in Brisbane, it's like if you're coming to Dolby, you've got to kind of stay over on the weekend. Uh, so they would, they would never think that way. So, um, and, and so I think it is kind of a struggle for people when they come out here. Uh, often they go, oh, I didn't realise you've got McDonald's and you've got KFC and you've got shopping centres and all that sort of stuff. The sad uh, indictment uh, there, McDonald's and KFC is a definer yeah. of culture in your roster. Yeah. No. yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, the, the tyranny of distance thing, I think we're talking regional 
I think in terms of regional, rural, remote, that's the way I think of Australia off the coast. And so I'm like Ross, I, I drive to Sydney and back. We've got people, professionals in government who drive to Sydney and back all for business. Mm. Uh, but yeah, people coming here, seven years ago I tried to get someone to come and work with us and it was what, moved to Orange. Um, uh, but when you go further west, so my son lives five hours from me up in Weewool. Um, I'm from the Ningan district. I used to be farming out there. Like that's that's an, that's a further 350 k's west of here. That um, the more yeah distance becomes a real issue. Mm. Um, partic- One of the things I'd say. I'm not sure if this is what this is like for you, Ross, but um, Orange, where 60 k's from Bathurst, where 140 k's from Dubbo. And so I always think of regional towns or towns as bits of islands, bits of communities within themselves. Yes, there's a bit of connection, but you very much got to think about what happens within that community. It is a community. It is defined geographically, uh, not by, we're not separated by a sea of water, but a sea of grass. And, you know, uh, there's not much in between the towns. Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, we've got people who commute to Bathurst and back for work, but that'd be a small, a small um, percentage, very small percentage. So, um, you you wake up, go to school, go to work, go to church, play sport in the same community, and that that's actually we find that's a great strength for ministry because community. You know, people from our church are everywhere in the community. Very easy to be playing sport with, shopping with, working with someone who you go to church with, or if if you bring someone to church, they'll bump into someone they know for sure. Mm. And, so uh, I was going to ask, that. I was going to pick up on that later because both of you use that phrase "family is king." I wonder how that affects evangelism um, in terms of reaching. Uh, whether whether it, it's a help or a hindrance in terms of reaching. We might come back to that just a little bit later. Bruce, can I stay with you for a second? Because um, you both of you uh, are leading churches that um, are healthy and growing. I haven't been out to Orange Evangelical, but I have been to Dolby, and I've seen the community, the Christian community that's there, how they are reaching people, uh, a growing staff team, a growing church itself. Bruce, can I just ask you, what, what have been the things that you've you had to learn um, about doing ministry in regional Australia, um, yeah, being in Orange. What are what are the differences you've you've learnt while being there? Um, I was distracted slightly by the technology. Um, <clears throat> so just evangelism in in Orange. So before this, I I was. Yeah. Um, hello, you got me? Have you got me? Yeah, got you. I've got you. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, in Orange, we have um, moved really away from event evangelism um, to just helping our people see that they're dis- to be a Christian is to be a disciple-making disciple. Um, and so um, we, I think community is a great advantage for us for evangelism. Um, um, yeah, so we run Christianity Explored every term. Uh, we always have non-Christians attend that, invited by friends. And the way we do that is usually a Christian friend will invite a non-Christian friend and they'll sit down and do uh, Christianity Explored together. Hmm. Um, Just the, the two of them together? Oh, no, in, in a group. Um, yeah, yeah, sometimes... We're we're actually been exper- experimenting with a Bible study group or a growth group, uh, all inviting a non-Christian friend along. Uh, that was great. That worked well. Worked well. Um, I think the community nature of of our town um, means that, uh, and the way I just think the way we do church. Church is one of our greatest evangelistic um, events because people. Get to know a, a, you know, someone, a, a Christian friend. They come along to church. They see authentic Christianity in action. 
they meet other people that they know there, they feel welcome. I think you've got to think about how you do church. Um, but, um, yeah, so we, we've moved very much to a disciple, making disciple approach to evangelism and away from event evangelism. Yeah. Yeah. But, you, but Sundays are still a, a big front door for you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we've yeah. always got people coming, invited, turning up. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and the statistic, irrespective of whether it's the city or the or rural areas, it seems to be church is around seventy percent often the the first significant contact that people have with the gospel, yeah. uh, and so getting that right and contextual, yeah, seems to be really important no matter where you are. Ross, what, and I uh, think, what think that, that sorry, Bruce, go on. I just think that the the strength we have is is that you you'll probably be working with or playing sport with someone you'll go to church with, which I understand in Sydney, you know, you might work, live on the Blue Mountains, but work on the North Shore. And yeah. so you just don't have that, you know, community connection, which, um, yeah, so that, that works for us. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, good. Yep. Uh, Ross, yeah. what, what things have you learned? Yeah, uh, so things that I've learned uh, in kind of ministry here. Uh, like one, I, I'd say, uh, what Bruce is saying about community is so true. Um, you, you, you meet, you're meeting people all the time, and so uh, you need to be relational. Um, so uh, you know that's that's one of the big things. Just be relational with people. Um, you what know, do you mean, Mike? Can you just tease that out for me, just as a, a relationally challenged person? What does what what does that look like? Does that mean um, uh, you you going to things that happen in the community, being involved, having positions? What what kind of things do you do? Yeah. yeah. So I, I see myself as part of the community here, uh, not just part of the, the church community, but part of the community in Dolby. So uh, I want to make sure that I'm connecting with people in the community um, and not just kind of hidden away in a church. So I'm, I'm thinking all the time about how do, I, how, do I, how do I myself connect with my community? So, you know, I want to join the golf club and play golf with people. You know, part of me was, uh, part of what I did was I decided I'm, I'll, I'll chair the ministers fraternal in town because that gave me access into kind of thinking about connecting with the other, with the community in different ways, you know. So when the flood came, you know, uh, here, you know, I was, I was centre stage there. I had access to lots of different, you know, people that um, because of, you know, my role as the chairman of the fraternal. Um, you know, just and, and then down to the little things, you know, like what Bruce is saying about people, uh, you know, you just want to be a disciple making disciple. So, just you know, yourself, you need to be out there just chatting with people and talking with people. And um, so, that, that's how I do it here, yeah. yeah. So, yep. you know, that, that's a key thing. I think the other thing is for me, I want, to, I want to do good for the community. I live in this community, people care about the community, that's why they live in, in a place like this. And so I'm always thinking about how can we, as a church, do good for the community? Um, what, are, what are the things that we can do that will just show that we care about this place that we live in? Um, so, you know, we, we, we try and, you know, create things uh, that will just help us connect with the community as a church. You know, things like, uh, for example, like we start up a mops group here, uh, Mothers of Preschoolers. We realise, you know, if family's king, uh, you know, there's lots of mums uh, here that need help in mothering. Um, so let's provide something for them. You know, older adults struggle with health uh, and isolation. Let's, you know, provide something for them. So we've started up a, a ministry yeah. called Staying Sharp that connects with kind of older adults and their health and so forth. And we've connected with the local nursing home in town. And we've connected with physios in town about that. And and so forth. So I'm, I'm making connections all the time with the community in which we live. Uh, yeah. So that the community sees the church as valuable um, and it gives us opportunities to kind of gossip the gospel and invite people to, um, you know, to hear more about Christianity. Yeah, that's great. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> can I just ask you about evangelism? So there's, um, we often talk about felt needs, um, the underlying connections or the, the ways in which the gospel will uh, address people in, in various cultures, in various contexts, in various situations. Um, what, are the, what are the underlying felt needs? They might be exactly the same as everywhere else and at some level we, we're all struggling, uh, we're all asking similar questions just from a different angle. But as you, you've worked in, in more rural ministries, in more 
big country towns. What are the questions people are asking? What are the things that they are struggling with that you you are bringing the gospel to bear on their lives? Um, um, okay, Ross. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, I think you're right. Uh, I, I think it's it is the same needs whether you're in the city or the country. Mm. Um, and you know, people have got uh, they've, they've got the need to connect. Um, they've got relational kind of needs. They they want to connect. Um, you know, they, uh, you know, we suffer the same kind of things that happen in the city. There's relational breakdown all the time. Um, you know, there's parents who are desperately in need of kind of help. How do I parent my child? Uh, there's marriages in trouble. How do we, how do we kind of hit on that area of kind of helping people in their marriages? Uh, how do we deal with those who are divorced? Um, you know, they're the kind of felt needs of the community. Uh, isolation and loneliness of old adults. Um, yeah, there's certainly some of the kind of felt needs around the place. Mm. Yeah. What would you say, Bruce? Yeah, I'd I'd say the same thing. Um, like we're we're just as post-Christian as the city, um, and it might might show itself in different ways, but um, yeah, relationships. People are in relationship difficulty, generally speaking. Uh, mental health, families, how to raise your kids, and people see Christians uh, managing life well, uh, and and it shines. It it um, and I can think of numerous people who who come to church because they've seen something different in their Christian friend's life, and just sort of said, "What's that about?" And they come along, and they. One of the things that I've noticed time and time again, people walk into church. It's not what they imagined it would be, and they see this, you know, um, right across the age range, a bunch of people getting on um, with uh, a belief in God which helps them, and uh, or in Christ that helps them. So I, I think. I think, um, yeah, the, the the needs that people have as they come to us, uh, they usually come through relationships, um, and they they're usually around a a life which is in a mess because, um, you know, they just um, lost all. They have no kind of no belief system, materialistic. Mm. Um, Mental mental health. Um, one of our congregations has has grown through um, friends of people who struggle with mental health, and they've and they've met at courses or in facilities, and and so we have uh, Christian people who have been struggling with depression or some sort of breakdown, bringing uh, people along with them. So it's. I really, I, I guess it goes to that disciple making disciple approach to things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so just before we open up to questions, so if people have got questions, they might just in the right hand side. There's a few coming through, and I will get to them. We had a few sent beforehand. I uh, haven't forgotten about those ones. Um, just before we do get to people's questions, can I ask you both? You've mentioned a few things that your church is doing that you do in your ministry, but what have been the things that you have um, you found? Uh, uh, you know, strategic, if we can use that word without all the negative connotation, what have been the most strategic, helpful things that you have done as a church and in your own leadership uh, in order to establish the church in the community and reach people with the gospel in, in Orange and Dolby? I'm going to start with you, Ross, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the most helpful things is trying to kind of get people to focus on, um, on evangelism. And uh, and helping people to kind of do that evangelism together. Um, mm. So we talk about, you know, Red Paul Borden talks about uh, net fishing. Um, he says there's rod and reel fishing that you do as individuals, um, but actually one of the things you can do is net fishing together as a church. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, one of the things I've been trying to do is kind of help people to do evangelism by saying, hey, listen, you know, Jesus sent people out two by two. Uh, let's kind of do evangelism together as a church and as small groups and so forth. So, 
um, you know, so the challenge I'm given to the congregation all the time is, yeah, okay, in your small groups, think about what sort of mini mission can you do together? How do you, how can you connect to the community and love the community, and and relate to the community and make relationships that you can then start to gossip the gospel. Um, and, and so, so what are know, they, where are they taking that? So, uh, so things like. Um, uh, so you know, we always get involved in the National Day of Thanksgiving because it's mm -hmm. such a great idea to kind of it's it's easy to make connections with the community there. So you know, one group says, "Oh, uh, I want to connect with the bus drivers in town and thank them for their work in picking up kids." You know, so mm -hmm. one group got you know decided to get uh, the the chappies at the school to write um, to get the kids to write thank you letters to the bus drivers. You know. And we organised, uh, one group organised, uh, went down to the bus depot and said, hey, listen, can we put on a morning tea for you? And just to say thank you for the work that you did and presented them with the cards and, and make connections with the bus drivers that way. Another group did mm -hmm. the same thing with kind of coaches in town of the rugby union. Got all the coaches together and just talked to them about, you know, how good it is that you serve in the community in this way. Um, yep. You know, we, we do things like one group decided uh, that they were going to organise gift bags that every year 12 student that was leaving school uh, got the whole church involved in writing letters to year 12 students and oh. then uh, started to put gift bags together and present them to the school. And uh, my daughter happened to be in year 12 at that time and, uh, and, and she said she had teachers coming to her saying, um, I want you to go back to your dad and tell your dad how, how, how thankful for, we are for you doing something like that for the community and for our school. Um, you know, so, so things like that where you're kind of doing that kind of net fishing together um, is really good ways to kind of connect to the community. Um, and then we do kind of try and do bigger things as a church together. So we've got a strategic building here that's right on a main uh, corner of a main street. And uh, so every year we put together a, a massive Christmas lights display, the whole church gets involved in that have this walk through uh, where people just come and walk through the church. We might have 200 people in a night just come through from our community. And, yeah. uh, you know, we have people just there ready to chat to people and talk to people and, you know, invite them to church. And, um, yeah, so, so they're the kind of bigger things, you know, we want to have, you know. Uh, so we just, we don't do lots of events, um, but uh, you know, but there's two or three strategic evangelism opportunities. Mm. Um, you know, Alpha has been an important part. You know, that, that's played an important part here because uh, yep. it's one of the ways that people can, you know, then once they make the connection, uh, can they bring them to something where they join a community for a yep. for a period? And so Alpha's worked really well like that, where they come along for ten weeks and and start to kind of mingle regularly with Christians and uh, hear yeah. the gospel that way. So yeah, there's right. some of them. That's great. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Chris? Yeah, um, what have we done that has strengthened our evangelism? I think um, strengthened the, the faith of, of our people so that they have confidence and courage, mm. but also shifting the focus of, of just growing that uh, discipleship culture that each person at church is encouraged and taught and trained to take on themselves the responsibility of um, talking Jesus, sharing their faith. Um, the other thing I'd say is that um, we've grown a welcoming culture um, so I can like that's welcoming to church um, and a few years ago I said I, I, I thought we ought to be running our growth groups, church services, everything we do so that we would be able to bring a non-Christian along. Now, um, so, and, and that's, that's been I think very powerful yeah. but coupled with that um, is we've we just run Christianity Explored all the time. So someone might be in a conversation at work, they might have brought a, a non-Christian friend to church, whatever. Um, they know that they might have just missed the last course, but in three or four weeks' time, 
there's the next Christianity ex Explored course. I'll take my friend along. We'll do uh, six weeks. Um, so it's, um, you know, growing that personal ownership of disciples, making disciples, speaking the gospel, mm. but backing that up. Um, we have a we have a real commitment to in our preaching to make sure that we um, keep the non Christian in mind. Um, we don't build our sermon our preaching around that, but we mm. keep that in mind. Evangelistic preaching, um, but I think yeah, backing that up with that organised program where people can come along and just sit down. And hear the gospel in a really good, good, uh, relaxed environment. Yep. What do you do when no one signs up to that? Do you still run it, or you get other people, Christians, in to run it so they're familiar? What do you do when no one signs up? I can only think of one time when that, when when we, yeah, no one signed up, and we just decided, okay, we're not going to do it. I can only think okay. of once. That's fantastic. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And and I think it, it's a it's it's a, it's sort of a cultural thing. What, when you keep talking about it and you keep saying who are you going to bring along to Christian Explode and keep promote keep promoting it, um, yeah, people go okay. I've got to step up to the plate. They see the leadership serious about this. I think I better get serious about it. Um, mm. And I, I think deep down, you know, if you're a Christian, you you. You have a relationship with God and an and eternal security. You want your non-Christian friends to be, to become, you know, followers of Christ, to be saved. Mm. Um, and so it's it's fanning that concern into flame, and yeah. giving them opportunity to, you know, um, know that if they're going to step across the line and have that conversation, we're going to back them up with, uh, you know, something that. That uh, will help them. Yeah. So. yeah, I think one of the interesting things, um, just you know, jumping off what you're saying, Bruce, like we've run the Alpha course a number of times, uh, but the way that we do that is by gathering together a whole people, a whole group of people that are willing to be involved, and then saying to them, okay, who are the people that we can invite? Let's let's kind of list them on the board, all the kind of people that we've got relationships with that we could invite. Let's start praying to uh, to God for them before we even hand out an invitation for them to come. Uh, and we found there's lots of fruit that comes from that as you gather people together, as you start praying for those people that you're going to give invites to. Um, you know, we found that um, that God answers that prayer, and and lots of people come along. Um, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, one of the things, Derek, that that I I think really has helped our welcoming culture, and that is, um, we have every kind of person involved in church. Um, so we've got tradies who lead church, mm. um, because basically, if a tradie comes to church and there's a tradie leading church. The, the guy who's walked in feels welcome because he thinks I'm like that bloke up the front. I belong here, yeah. and so we we think about that. We we keep um, the community of Orange is represented in the community of OEC. We don't just have you know the good looking articulate people up the front. We have normal people up front, uh, everyday people, and um, uh, that that creates a, a flavour, a culture. A feel that makes welcoming well people feel welcome yeah they're not made welcome they feel it yeah 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 that's great um, just a shameless plug here on some of the stuff that, that Ross and Bruce have been um, uh, mentioning there if you go to training church in a box online we've got a course on evangelism from the front um, talking through some of the things that, that Ross and Bruce have said about how you how you integrate thinking about the Christian and the non-christian in in your language, in your meetings, in your preaching, and all those kind of things, uh, which yep. does create a culture of, of doing that kind of thing. We might just turn to some questions now that people have been um, throwing in. Can I, first of all, and we, we have picked up on this a little bit, but I think it's worth just pulling the thread a little bit more. Um, people have asked questions from a few different ang angles about the evangelism and the family orientation of, of more rural ministries, particularly for 
yeah, for evangelism, but also for planting. Is it is it harder to plant in the country because things are tight knit, um, uh, and is it or is it easy to do evangelism in the country because things are tight knit? I don't think evangelism is easy anywhere, but uh, thoughts on that? Um, yeah, go, Ross. Uh, so I would think um, personally, I think it's easier to do evangelism in the country uh, if you can provide a consistent Christian witness. Uh, over a long period of time, then then it creates that ability to speak into people's lives, um, and uh, and I think one of the benefits of country ministry is that uh, is that people are working, playing, eating, you know, with each other all the time. They'll go down the shops, they'll see people. Uh, you know, I go down the shops. Uh, I don't like going down the shops on my day off because there's just too many people to talk to. Um, you know, but I think, uh, in one sense, if you can just be a consistent Christian witness, you'll have opportunities to speak into people's lives. Um, um, and so, I think, uh, at some level, it's it's easier um, because I'm seeing people regularly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what do you reckon? Yes, yeah. um, I I yeah tick all those boxes. I think that's right. Um, I mean, I I'm a boy from the bush. I've been sharing the gospel ever since I was old enough to do it, I guess, and I've never found that difficult. Um, so I think everything you said is right. About church planting in the bush, in the country, um, so I, I start, when I was farming, I started a church myself um, at Ningen, uh, and I coached three guys who, church, who planted churches in... Uh, regional places and that's a whole other story. I don't know that um, the family thing has got a lot to do with that. Um, yeah, I guess I guess that's a that's something that I'm involved in and have had a bit of experience in. Um, it, it, it's it's a completely different kettle of fish to planting a church in Metropolitan Australia simply because of numbers. Um, it, it's got to be really thought through well. Um, I want people to do it. Um, you know, you, you get a, you get a church the size of say Dolby, twelve thousand people. You've probably got three or four mainline denominations represented. The doors may be closed, they may be open. There's a number of things to think through there, um, but. Um, but I, I think community community connection helps church planting, but it also hinders it. So there you go. That's a whole other subject, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So are denominations helpful in the country? Um, do they provide a, a level of recognition or acceptance, uh, or it, it doesn't make a difference? It's more important that you're actually involved in a community for people to break down those barriers. Uh, I yeah. think they do, um, but. Um, I think the, you know, everything that's happened in the last ten years that has brought the church into disrepute. Um, well, you know, like thirty years ago, a local Anglican or local clergyman was probably on the level of a doctor. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> now, I, I don't know. Someone said, "Yeah, we're the level of a jockey," but, <laughs> um, but, but it's it's because of, of the the barrage of criticism about. You know, from modern atheism through to um, the whole um, horror of child abuse, and so there's some some burdens to bear there. Um, but what, one thing I would say that I've noticed is that you would think you could make generalisations about regional towns or country towns. You can't. Um, every town is different, and it requires careful thought. Um, you just can't make generalisations. Yeah, yeah, no, that's helpful. Um, Ross, you're you're involved in denominational ministry. I'm not, so I ought to defer to you, mate. Yeah, yeah. I think actually denominations are becoming less important. Uh, uh, and what I find here is that people are swapping from denomination to denomination. Uh, you know, so. And I think that would be true in in the city as well. That, that 
actually denominations are becoming less important. People are just wanting to go to a kind of Bible-believing church, whether it be a Baptist church or a Presbyterian church or an Anglican church. Yeah. Um, you know, but one of the one of the things about a town like this is that you've got to be really positive about. Uh, I'm I'm really positive about all the churches in town because I realise that uh, you know they're all connected. You know, people are people have got family members in other denominations. Um, you know, so I want to be positive uh, about that. I don't want to speak ill of kind of other brothers and sisters and. Um, uh, yeah, um, yeah, um, yeah. I, I think yeah. You know, I, I think gone are the days when you know when I first arrived here seventeen years ago. I remember having a conversation with an elderly uh, elderly lady uh, who said, you know, we talked about evangelism, and she said, "Look, there's just no more Presbyterians I know, Ross." And uh, and and that kind of thought of you know we can only reach out to Presbyterians is just not there any longer. Yes. Yeah, that's good. Um, uh, Bruce, look, I just push in. We've got a, a question. People want you to um, uh, to push into that uh, question of community connection hindering church planting. Um, how do you go tap about tapping into opportunities that'll be helpful? What guidelines do you use? So, if if possible, it sounds like you've you've thought into this a uh, fair bit, and you've you've got some. Uh, some opinions. Unfiltered is great, but any thoughts on that? Yeah, no. So, so I've been in it and done it <laughs> as a mm. farmer starting a church out of necessity, um, uh, and I'm involved in it through coaching guys. Um, but the experience of uh, Orange Evangelical Church here, it, I came here about ten years after it began, but. Um, so a group of like-minded people got together because they were despairing of uh, any church in town actually uh, teaching the Bible well and consistently um, evangelising. Uh, and so a group of like-minded people from across a number of churches decided that it was the right time to um, plant a church in Orange. And they did that very intentionally. They had purpose, um, and and it's been it's been a great thing. Um, I actually think that uh, yeah yeah. So um, so that that's the positive of. But but this is in a town of back then it was probably thirty thousand people. It's now forty thousand, something like that. Um, when you get into a smaller country town. Um, like I've said for years, the Protestant Christianity is divided, at, divided and conquered itself in regional rural Australia because you have strong denominational ties saying we, we're Baptists, we're Methodists, we're Presbyterians, we're Anglicans. Um, now that those churches have declined, you have people from all those churches who are wanting to be taught the Bible yet have a loyalty to maybe their parents, you know, elderly people they respect and and so gathering a group of like-minded people becomes a bit problematic. Yes, they'd like to join you for all the right reasons but they won't for reasons of respect and culture and whatever. Um, and so I think church planting in regional rural towns really has to be thought through. A lot of, lot of forethought, patience, planning has got to go into it. Um, I, one of the disadvantages, I think, is it's just that profit in your own town thing. Um, like, personally, I think every church that wants to plant every group of people that think we need a church planted in this town if we can't revitalize or repot an existing church they ought to from day one be planning to and putting money away to uh, one day employ a church a trained church planter from outside to come and work with them they can start and get going before that but I think that that ought to be a long-term plan because of 
kind of community ties. You know, oh, you know, like when I started the church in in Ningen, I mean, I was just a farmer. I mm. wasn't trained. It was, it was basically what made me go and be trained because I realised I needed training. But but if you're a local guy who started a church, however well-meaning, well-trained, articulate you are, the people in your church and others will be um, thinking, you know, can he take us to where we want to go? Uh, there will be a bit of, he's the same as me. Um, and so thinking about um, getting someone to come and work with you, I think, I think is something that ought to be on the agenda. Um, can yeah. I push into that? Is that all right? Because uh, we've yeah. uh, one of the questions that we had come in is is about recruiting gospel workers for regional Australia and rural Australia, but also that that question of uh, a lot of Australia is far flung, and so some people I know are looking up to three churches where the churches are two hundred fifty kilometres in kind of radius, um, and the church can only afford them for maybe three days a week. So if we're going to reach these areas and they desperately need to hear the gospel and we're going to uh, recruit people to come out to the country and not just kind of gravitate towards the city, any thoughts on, on how we do that, how you've both done that or other options, bivocational ministry, what, what's an effective way to reach Australia? Ross, do you want to uh, start I think, with you? Yeah, Ross, go. You go. No, you go. Uh, um, oh, well, I think... Um, um, in some places, you've just got to think about a different model. I think you, we've got to think more of, of the kind of things we do in mission and overseas. People move somewhere to work. I, I think in some places, people have got to plan long and think, OK, I'm going to start a Bible study in my home. Um, you know, I'm, I've, I'm trained. I've been to college. Um, I'm going to, or, or, I, or I'm trained enough from my local church to begin something. Uh, and start small, and um, and and work up from there. Um, it's what one of the one of the great, I think, the great challenges regional Australia faces is that, um, with all the best intentions in the world aside, it is hard for someone from the city to go and live in, you know, a, a rural town of three thousand people. That's three hours from the nearest regional town where there's actually a hospital that, that you know the services you need and six hours from the capital city you came from mm. and one of the challenges uh, and I think the church has dropped the ball on this and that is the local churches and I think particularly regional big churches need to be training up people from the country for the country you need to be intentional about that um, yeah, yeah, because it's it's kind of cross country ministry. I don't know what Ross would say about that. If you've if you've lived in in Sydney all your life or Brisbane all your life, and you move to a town of ten thousand or five thousand or three thousand people, it's a cross cultural experience. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a cross cultural experience for me moving to Sydney to go to college. <laughs> Thought I'd landed on Mars, you know. So. <laughs> Are there any of those networks yeah. out there that exist? Sorry, say that again. Um, uh, those networks that are raising people up specifically for thinking about sending them into the country. Just off the top of your head, do you know any? I'm having a bit of a crack. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, no, but it needs to be thought about. Yeah. Yep. Good. Yeah. Sorry, Ross, sorry to interrupt you. I, I totally agree with Bruce in the sense of if we're going to send people out to the country, uh, they need to come from these bigger churches. So, like I, I'm thinking about that all the time uh, in terms of, you know, taking on interns uh, here, um, you know, giving them a, a, an experience of kind of country ministry. Um, you know, I'd like to see more kind of teams from kind of colleges come out to the country and have a kind of experience and a taste of country ministry. Um, I, you know, so I want to see that happen more. Uh, I also want to um, create partnerships, I think, with those people that are going out to those kind of smaller country towns. So, um, you know, so as a, as a Presbyterian church, you know, one of the great strengths is that we have these presbyteries. And I know our presbyteries just started thinking about how do we 
kind of pool re resources together to help fund kind of ministry in, in these smaller country charges as well. So, you know, last year uh, our presbytery from different churches, you know, gathered, you know, $40,000 uh, and set that aside to, to help, you know, fund uh, ministers coming out to the country and, and working out here. Because part of the problem is that some of these churches have got so small, um, they don't have the funds to, to, to get a kind of minister out here. Um, and so, yeah, we've got to raise up people that, that come from the country that are willing to, you know, and, and most people that actually, you know, come from the country, they do want to go back to, to country. Um, you know, they, get, they do get a little bit lost in the city, I think. Um, and we just had one guy recently, you know, that had been down to theological college in, uh, in Brisbane for the last few years. And... Um, and he's come back to you know a country charge now, and uh, he, he didn't like the experience in the city. Uh, yeah. He was happy to come back. So, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, what, one of the problems that we, the de denominational church, has is that it's it's kind of a, it's a sort of a professional model, and and it's an expensive model, relevant to relative to the size of a lot of country churches, mm. and. Um, that's why I think um, denominational churches or thinking about planting a church in a country town, people need to be ready to think along a mission model, um, a different model. Um, and, you know, people will go to, we're you know, sponsoring a couple that are going to Albania. Um, they're going to do medical work and, and plant a church. And I go, okay, well, if it, Gee, Albania, you don't even know the language, you know. Mm. Um, um, we've got to be thinking about that for um, some of these places because, like in my lifetime, I've seen strong denominational churches decline and they're in real trouble because they now can't afford to put someone on under their model, under what they've been used to. Mm. And... And as you can imagine, they're mostly older people, older faithful people, and trying to get them to change um, to a new way of thinking about ministry, a new model, is is massive. And it, and it, there's a certain amount of sort of pride in it too. You know, you've got this big church, you've got all this infrastructure um, that represents a complete other model of ministry. Mm. Which is actually beyond them to afford, and so helping people to think through that's really, it's really challenging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah certainly, and bivocational ministry is something which we, uh, Geneva Push, we've been thinking through uh, as well. We've got some guys doing it. Big shout out to Liam Doyle up on um, uh, in New South Wales. He, he's kind of uh, doing that yeah. as well. But it's it's a hard road, um, and uh, we need to change our thinking about it. That's really helpful. Uh, just we need to wrap up. Can I ask, uh, just as a, a kind of closing statement for people doing uh, ministry in regional Australia, or alternatively, our prayer as well is that people will uh, head out there. Any any final thoughts on uh, or pitch for regional Australia and the gospel and the needs out there? Oh. Yep. Uh, so, uh, yeah, like I think there, there's needs everywhere you go, and certainly uh, there's needs out here. And um, you know, and I I think uh, country ministry is a is a great ministry. I, I've I've done city stuff, uh, spent my first thirty years in the city, um, but I, I think you've got opportunities out here to create real connections with people. Um, and you know, if you can come out to the country and start connecting with the community, which I think is easier to do uh, than than in the city, then uh, I think you can grow churches out uh, in country ministry. Yeah, um, and I think you know, and, and I do think I, I just going back, I just think some of the bigger places just need to continue to support um, you know uh, ministry in the in in these kind of rural sort of places. So you know, if you can hook in with a larger church that's trying to do something, um, then I think you'll get the support you need as well. Yep. A um, couple of things that occur to me, anyone listening to this um, who is from regional rural Australia, 
if you're trained and uh, then think about going back to regional rural Australia. You're currently living in the city because um, you'll get it, um, you'll cope with it. Um, so challenge to those who are from the bush, think about heading back. Another thing is don't do it alone. Um, get a network of friends, uh, think about financial support um, and for those who are in that circumstance um, don't do it alone. Get, um, like Ross said, hook into a, a, a regional centre but, but get support like um, the isolation uh, can be a real problem um, but uh, dig into the experience of others, the support of others um, but I would say, um, don't wait around. God's put you, you there, with the thoughts He's given you, um, and so start, pray, mm. plan long, uh, but don't sit around and wait for someone to come along and do it for you. Yep, mm. have a crack. Yep. Brilliant. Under God. Yeah, look at the. The, the beauty of being part of, of a network like Geneva Bush is we have uh, people who have experienced having done this and uh, done it well and struggled with it and moved through it. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we don't have to do it alone. We can, we can uh, yeah. talk to other people who've made mistakes and then done well. It's, it's a great benefit of being part yeah. of a network. Yeah. Gents, can I thank you both for your time? We've got, I'm going to throw back to Gus in a second. Uh, Ross, Dolby, if you're ever in Dolby, drop into Dolby Prezi. It'd be great to see you. Thanks for your wisdom and your uh, guidance, Bruce, in, in Orange as well. Uh, gents, we're going to uh, throw back to Gus, but thanks very much. If you're thinking about regional, coastal, planting and ministry and strengthening churches, we would, Geneva Bush would love to chat to you and put you in touch with people who uh, are thinking through that as well. Thanks, Gus. Fantastic, and thank you, Derek. Thanks for hosting this morning. But yeah, big thank you mostly to, to Ross and to Bruce for joining us this morning. That was uh, great both to learn from their wisdom and experience. Uh, so thank you guys for joining us this morning. Hope that uh, you're listening wherever you happen to be uh, around Australia. Thanks for tuning in this morning. Thanks for taking your time. Um, if, if you missed some segments or had to drop out for a little bit, uh, this morning has been recorded. So uh, it'll be up on the website in a few days for you to be able to watch back over if there's stuff where you just wanted to take some notes. So uh, that's been recorded if you're keen to have another watch through. Um, also, you can look on the website for uh, some uh, previous uh, planter sessions. So if you're keen to check out other topics that we've uh, looked at before, those are on the website. So make sure you check those out on uh, the resources section of the Geneva Push website. Um, make sure you check us out uh, for the next time. In about three weeks, we've got uh, our next webinar coming up, and that is Tried and Tested Evangelism that Reaches People of Other Faiths. So uh, really looking forward to that one. That's going to be at 9.30 on the 16th of August. We've got Ray Galea, Dan King, and Pete Coe is going to be interviewing those guys. So looking forward to that. You can jump onto the website in the event section to sign up for that and get the reminders through the email to uh, make sure that you're able to make along for that, but it will also be recorded. And just as we finish up again this morning, just want to thank uh, EA Insurance again for their support of the planter sessions. They've been fantastic in giving us a thumbs up for this and to help us put these together. So thank you to them. Make sure you check them out if you do have insurance needs for your church or church plan. Thanks again for joining us this morning. It's been great to have you join us. Again, the recording will be up online in a couple of days and uh, for you to be able to enjoy again. Um, that's all for us this morning. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to finish this webinar up now, so enjoy the rest of your days. Take care. Cheers.